Now that we have the net present value outlined, now we're going to get into the bigger picture of capital budgeting. And we're going to talk about relevant information and cash flows. In the previous lecture, we talked about the decision criteria and rules. We introduced the net present value and the internal rate of return. We did it in context of the mechanical post hole digger. And we calculated the net present value based on the cash flow method of net present value. Uh, we noticed that it was a positive net present value. So we asked the question, well, what's the yield or the internal rate of return? We calculated that. In calculating the yield or the internal rate of return, we pointed out that there's not a direct way to calculate that that we have to go through a search procedure. And that search procedure is used on your calculators as well as the computer on how to come up with that number. We also stated that there can be multiple solutions for yield. We're not going to step into that in this class, but I want you to understand that there are multiple solutions. There's ways to handle that, but that's a topic that you'll hopefully uh, get in the next a course in finance. Then we talked about the fact that we needed to actually calculate the net present value using the component method because we need to analyze the capital budget. We need to look at what makes up the net present value to better analyze that number. And thus we laid out in a formula by its components how to calculate the net present value. Today's lecture we're going to talk about the four steps for investment decisions and then we're we're going to do the center pivot irrigation system and look at how to incorporate the four steps of capital budgeting. The reading assignment is chapter 10. There are four steps in the investment decisions. One is to identify the alternative investments. We have to know what's out there so we appropriately identify the best. The other is to collect relevant information. The third step is to lay out the cash flows in a timeline. And the fourth step is the analysis. And in the analysis so far, we've talked about profitability. The decision criterion for profitability is the net present value and the internal rate of return. But later on, we're going to talk about risk. Although some of you have wanted to talk about risk and incorporate that into our discussion, we've said, well, hold off, let's wait. We'll bring it in later. Well, it's coming. And the other is sensitivity. As I mentioned, the net present value just by itself isn't all that meaningful because you calculate a net present value is based on some assumption of what's happening out there in the future. But if somebody tells me they know with a certainty what the price of corn is going to be in three years, four years, five years, I can tell them that they're emphatically wrong. They have some guess, but they don't know. Thus, we have to account for the sensitivity of our numbers that we're putting into the equations. We also, at this point, haven't said anything about debt. How is debt or our ability to borrow money? How does that affect our decision? So those, when we get into the analysis, which is the crux of this class, we're going to start bringing in more of these issues. Right now, the focus is more on laying out the problem and calculating the net present value. Then we'll add the other dimensions. OK, the first step, identifying the alternative investments. Now, these are interrelated, but we'll look at them in these components. One is for the uh, maintenance and replacement. Now, all of you already deal with this particular one in your personal finances, or soon will. If you've got a, a truck, or maybe even a computer, when do you replace it? You're going to replace it every two years, which some people do, because they want to always be driving something new, something that doesn't break down, something that they can sell at a fairly high value. Other people drive it till it's after 10 years, 12 years, they drive it into the ground. Which is better? How do you know which is better? Maybe you replace it after five years. Or what happens after five years, just one day after your warranty ends on your truck? And when your transmission goes out one day after your warranty, then what do you do? Do you spend the $1,200 on doing the transmission or do you scrap it? Do you fix the transmission you say, well, if that's going out, maybe the motor's next. At what point do you make these decisions? And the days where you can say, well, you know, my parents have always replaced every two years, you know, that's got to be the best way to do it. Those days are gone. You have got to start making your decisions. You've got to put a pencil to it. You've got to make those decisions. It may be good for you, it may not, but it has to be your analysis and your decision. Same with computers. You know, the day you take a computer off from the store, what do you know with certainty? There's a better one coming out next week, okay, at a lower price, too. At what point, then, do you replace it? Do you hang on to them for two years or three years? 
you know, my rule typically is, is three years. Is that right? You got to have a way to, to figure those things out. And you know, if you're talking about a big business, if you become the CEO or the financial manager of a large business, when do you replace that assembly line? Or when do you replace the canning equipment? When do you re replace the manual assembly with a robotic uh, equipment? You know, the next one is cost reduction. Let's take an example of feed yard. Uh, they have a feed mill. You know, they make their own feed, and then they have cowboys come in and fill the trucks up with that grain, and then they distribute it into the mangers, either mechanically on the truck or by hand, whatever, they fill up the mangers with the feed. Well, you'd have to look at, maybe there's a way to reduce costs. This, we have the trucks involved, we have the labor involved every day. Maybe we get a mechanical feeder, more reliable, we reduce the labor costs, and we have more uniform feeding so that we don't have as much slippage or wastage. How do you determine whether that's better or not? Just like the mechanical post hole digger, you have to say, well, what does it cost? What does it cost put in place? What's the maintenance cost? And what do I save in terms of labor and other capital costs? Last one is looking at income generating. Do you buy that extra 100 acres of land? Or maybe you say, well, I've got sons that are an age that they can drive combines. Maybe instead of paying for custom hire for somebody to come in and harvest our corn, Maybe we'll save some costs by buying a combine, but we'll also generate some income by putting my son out there, custom hiring for my neighbors. How do you evaluate whether that's a good thing or a bad thing? That's what we're looking at in terms of the different types of alternatives to look at. Now some of these, like the combine, can be mixed and matched. Some could be both cost reducing and income generating. Maybe they can be intertwined with maintenance and replacement. These are just broad categories. The uh, second step has to do with collecting relevant information. Now this is interesting because this is probably the most important step and maybe the hardest step and it's the one that we're going to spend the least time in class on. But I want you to understand that this is important because as the old adage, garbage in, garbage out. If you collect all the data and you're not confident, are you going to have any confidence in your analysis? You know, and the, obviously the answer is no. So th this is an important part of it. You have to have good information for you to be confident in your analysis. What are some of the things that you need to know? Well, you have to know the uh, initial investment cost. You have to know what are the cash revenues, what are the cash expenses to get your net return. What is your marginal tax rate? What's your depreciation for tax purposes? You have to go to your tax code or talk to a tax accountant as to figure out what, what you can claim for uh, depreciation. How long do you plan on keeping this investment? What's the useful life or what's your planning horizon? What's your after-tax terminal value? Are you going to be able to sell this for a positive amount or is it going to cost you to dispose of it? And then what's your after-tax discount rate? I personally own a cul-de-sac at the end of a street that has duplex. And we own three of the duplexes that make up that uh, cul-de-sac. So we own the, all that land that's in the cul-de-sac. Now what we've done in the past is we put in a full-size volleyball pit, put in the white sand, you know, put in lights. Uh, and we also have a fire pit, which has been very attractive. And we've cut trees down so there's lots of wood to burn. But one of the things that we have there, it's outside the city limits, and we have enough land there to put in seven 10 by 10 storage units. Or maybe we could put in 14 5 by 10, where we own the land, it's outside the city limits, so we can put that structure there. It's got a street of duplexes. None of the duplexes have storage units in it, so it's feasible to think of this as a what? An income generating investment. And since we already own the land, it's got some impossibilities to think of. Now it's got some negatives that we have to consider also. If that was put in there, it's not as an aesthetic pleasing view because now you're going to have a storage system that people look at at the end of the cul-de-sac. It also reduces the space for the fire pit that's very popular, it's, but it still can be done. It's just not as convenient. So if we're going to look at this as a possible income generating investment, what do we have to know? What's the first thing? Cost. Now that's not such a simple thing because if you're going to put that in, you've got to put the cement slab. You're likely to have to have either a hard surface road on the side of it or at least a, a gravel surface. So you're going to have to find out how much it costs to put in a cement slab. We also had to find out about easement. 
when we first looked at it, we thought we could put twice as many units. We thought we were looking at 14 10 by 10s or, or 28 5 by 10s. That was a lot more attractive. But we found there was an easement back there in the county that didn't allow us to put it as far back as what we wanted. We could put the road back there, but we couldn't put the structure. But we, we had to find out how much it cost to put in cement slabs, the materials, you know, and the materials, you got to look at that carefully, too, because as we started calling, people were giving us very good rates. But then when we asked what, what the caliber of the steel was, yeah, you can buy it cheap, but, you know, it's not going to last very long. What kind of doors do you put in it? People don't like having storage units where they can't open the doors. So you have to figure out what it's going to cost. What are the materials? Then what does it cost to, to put those up? Those are all things that we have to have firm numbers before we go very far into this. The next then is the returns. How much can we rent out a 5 by 10 storage unit? Well, you go to the people that rent those out, you get kind of an average of the occupancy, you get an idea of what they're renting for, well maybe $40 a month gives us an idea, well what's the cost associated with that? Well, for our particular units, the cost would be very minimal because we would incorporate that with the personnel that we already have that's running out the apartments that could do this as a side, so the cost wouldn't be that high. But we still have to account for the fact there is some labor costs associated with renting those out and the advertisement and the signage and that kind of thing. Then we look at the marginal tax rate. Well, we know which tax bracket we're in, so we know our marginal tax rate. Looking at the depreciation for tax purposes, I'd have to make a call to the uh, tax accountant or the IRS or look at a book. I think they'd probably be depreciated out at the same rate as rental properties. I'm assuming, although I'd have to check out for sure, but I think by straight line it'd be 27 and a half years I could depreciate it out. Then we look at the life of the investment. Well, they may last a long time, but for my planning horizon, I'd either have a 10-year, maybe a 15-year horizon. Even though it might last longer than that, that's my planning horizon. Uh, and then we'd look at the after-tax terminal value. Well, if we were to sell those duplexes, you know, let's say in 15 years, and, and there was a good business generating a certain amount, I suspect it would probably increase the value of those duplexes, maybe $20,000, maybe 30. And then, of course, what kind of discount rate would I use? Well, personally, uh, I wouldn't even look at those if the return wasn't somewhere between 16 to 25 percent. Actually, I think if we could keep those rented and fully occupied, my initial look at it is it is probably closer to, to 45 percent return. But I haven't put all the numbers to it yet. But that's where the sensitivity comes in because what if nobody rents them? You know, then I've got this nice structure here that's empty. You know, you get, those are all things that you have to factor in. That's the general flow then of the information that you need to collect. That's the mind process that you have to go through. It's the mind process that I go through. It's what you're going to have to learn also to, to do that. The uh, third step was the layout of cash flows. So we have in our chart, we have the uh, component. And our components, we've already determined the cost, the uh, after-tax net cash flow, the tax savings from depreciation, and the after-tax terminal value, which is equal to the net cash flow. That's what we generated today. These components, this step right here is what we developed and put forward today as the part of the net present value. And then of course we have the timeline. And if we look at this in the fourth step in analysis, if we basically take the net cash flow in every period and find its present value, then we're using the net cash flow method. If on the other hand we find the present value of each of those components and sum them up, then that's the component method, and that's what we've been working on today. But this is a problem that we're going to work on now in a, in a center pivot irrigation system. First of all, I put a picture up here on the screen. Uh, most of you, I'm quite sure, I'm probably 100% of you have seen a center pivot irrigation at least driving by from here to Dallas. The irrigation system works such that water is either pumped up or pumped to the middle of the field and then this irrigation system walks around the field in a circle in pre-programmed time so that it can put out water and in some cases other types of herbicides or fertilizer. Uh, it makes a circle. Uh, this isn't a class on irrigation. It's just to look at this one simple example where we have a circular center pivot irrigation system 
and the farmer is trying to decide whether it's going to be a good investment to provide greater water control or whether it's, he's better off in the current method of irrigating or not irrigating. Now if you look at page 42, I've collected the data for you. And it's something that I suggest that you do on these problems as you're working through one of your biggest battles is to read the verbiage on these things and know what's wanted and how to pick out the information. You can save yourself a lot of time if you go back to the previous slide that we covered today that says this is the information that we need. As you read through these problems, when it says the revenues are such, pull that number revenue and put it off to the side here. Say R equals 20,000. And if it says expenses are you know, 8,000 and pull it out and say expenses are 8,000. If it says the cost is 80,000, put cost, okay, is 80,000. Go through that verbiage once, pulling out all the information that you need and putting it to the side. Collect the relevant information. So, we're going to start our uh, journey now in determining what information we need, how to present it, and then get it into the timeline. The first question is the initial cost. And if you read page 42, it says that uh, this center pivot irrigation system is going to cost $80,000. That includes the materials and the labor and all the infrastructure work that is needed to put the irrigation system in place. A lot of information goes into that $80,000, but I've simplified it, just a flat $80,000. Notice that we put it in our worksheet under the uh, category of cost, and also notice that it shows under time zero, because that we're planning on paying it today. We next go to the component after-tax net returns. How do we calculate the after-tax net returns? Well, the net returns, as we've defined, is the cash revenues minus the cash expenses. If we look at the page 42, we're given that if we put that irrigation system in place, we expect to get an additional $20,000 of revenue. That's because better water control management being placed on the crops at a timely way, we expect that it's going to give us an extra $20,000 of revenue presumably because of, of higher yields. It's also determined because of maintenance and labor, this irrigation system is going to cost an extra $4,000 a year. So you have the 20,000 revenues minus the extra $4,000 expenses, the net returns then is the difference, which is $16,000. Okay, the after-tax net returns, we get an additional $16,000 from this irrigation system, but if we make an extra $16,000, who wants part of it? The government, Uncle Sam. So how do we account for that? Well, we worked through this showing you that to account for taxes, you multiply the net revenues times one minus the tax rate. We gotta first decide what the uh, tax rate is, and in this particular case, it's given that this farmer expects his marginal tax rate for every additional dollar that he makes, he's expecting to have to pay 20% of that to Uncle Sam. So to get the after-tax net returns, we multiply the uh, 16,000 net returns times one minus the tax rate. The net then is $12,800. That's what you get to keep. The difference between the 16,000 and the 12,800 is your contribution to the uh, government. As you're reading through the problem, you needed what? You needed the revenue, you needed the expenses, and you needed the marginal tax rate. So as you're reading through those problems, you start looking for those, pull those out of the verbiage. Then you do the arithmetic, and you have your answer. Now, once we calculated those after-tax net returns, and we've determined that that's going to be yearly, and we put those in the first year, the second year, the third year, why did we stop at year three? Because one of the pieces of information is the life of that investment, right? And you read through this problem and it says that this farmer expects to sell that irrigation system at the end of three years. Now, having said that, do you think it's a wise idea to plan for just a three years on an irrigation system after putting all that labor into getting it up and running? Why would I only have a planning horizon of three years on an irrigation system? Convenience. Fits on the screen. If I was doing this for real, my planning horizon would probably be more like in the tune of 10-year of horizon. I'm keeping it here compact so it fits neatly on the screen. And, and going out to 10 years doesn't change the problem any in the sense of how to do it. And I only throw that in because 
you know, for some of you that work in this, recognize that, that a three-year horizon for an irrigation system is probably not reasonable, but it is in this class because we're just using it to teach how to calculate the net present value.